And welcome once again to EWTN's bookmark, a special one coming to us from Australia, is our guest author, Father John Flatter. And his two books are Dying to Live, Reflections on Life After Death, and also The Final Exam, Preparing for the Judgment, published by Perugia Media. And I'm Doug Keck here. It's great to see you again, Father. Uh, we talked about six years ago about one of your earlier books. Yes, thank you. Good to have you to be back again, Doug. And yes, that was Journey into Truth, DVDs, and book on uh, instructions in the Catholic faith. And I understand EWCN used at least the, set, the DVDs on the creed to, on your programming. So it's, right. it's, it's been a very popular book, and it's helped a lot of people come, come into the faith. Right. So do you usually write books that only other people suggest to you? Because my understanding from reading these two books that both of these titles were ones that you didn't intend to read, that somebody suggested, I should say write, that suggested you write each one of them. No, I normally write books that I intend to write. And there's that series, Question Time, one, two, three, four, five, and six has just gone to the printer, Questions and Answers on the Catholic Faith. I write a column in the Catholic Weekly here in Sydney every week, and it's led now to some 900 questions being answered. So I write those books because I want to, but these two are unique. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a third one in the pipeline, which just uh, came up with in the last few weeks. But the first of these, Dying to Live, mm -hmm. I was never going to write a book on life after death until I was giving a retreat, and it's now in early January or late January of about maybe three years ago. And a man on that retreat said, Father, I'm 79. Wouldn't it be good if there were a book on life after death for people who don't believe in it? And I immediately took to the idea on one hand, because I didn't know of such a book, book on life after death for those who don't believe in it. Many books on the four last things written by Catholics and others. but. A book for do people who don't believe in it, I wasn't aware of one. And right. secondly, in my many years writing for the Catholic Weekly, I had written a lot on the topics that could go into that book. So I took to it immediately, and then I wrote it in about a year. And so that book came out at the suggestion of someone, and I thanked him mm -hmm. always and in various book uh, launches and whatnot and my, my personal conversations with him. Thank you for the suggestion, because without you, this book would not exist, and it's done a lot of good. Right. And then uh, a friend from Brisbane read that book, and he really liked it. He bought extra copies for his friends. And then he thanked me for the book, and he sent in an email saying, please write another book in this same style. And I thanked him for the suggestion, and that was the end of that. I was not going to write another book. I'm very busy, I don't have time to write books, mm -hmm. is the way I like to put it. Until a month or so later, I'm praying in our chapel, and I came up with an idea, well, the last chapter of Dying to Live is, what must I do? Mm -hmm. What must the reader do to get to heaven, someone who didn't believe in life after death and now mm -hmm. does? So I thought I could, if there's uh, material that I've already written, on that topic of how can I help the reader prepare right. for getting to heaven, then I thought, well, I've already written Journey into Truth. Mm -hmm. And part three of that, following part three of the Catechism, is all on morals. But what I had to do with, with this material was write the book again for people who are non-believers, people who are not Catholics, Christians, and other words, of course, these people will read it too. And they have, and mm -hmm. they've got a lot out of it. But I had to take the whole of morals in my life in Christ in part three of the Catechism and put it in lay terms, not going back to the Bible and, and uh, scripture and whatnot mm -hmm. and, and the Catechism, and put it in terms of natural law and human reason. So it was a bit of a challenge, but we ended up doing that. And I think it worked very well because a lot of people have read that book too now entitled The Final right. Exam. Well, let's go, but, uh, well, let's uh, Dying to Live, Reflections on Life After Death, taking that one up first. You mentioned the fact in the forward, this is uh, Wake Everybody Up, time is short. Most readers of this book will be in the last quarter of their lives, perhaps the last 10 or 5%. You go on to say, unfortunately, most people bring to the end of their lives, I thought this was interesting, the opinions they took on quickly and uh, 
you know, when they were in their teens, when death was a long way off. Why is that an important thing to understand about most people's opinions in related to this issue? Well, I, uh, we all have our ideas about life after death. And many, many people from their early childhood, maybe because their parents didn't believe, they went to school where nobody else believed either or tertiary education. Mm -hmm. And they just have never believed in this. They haven't gone to church. They don't have any particular religion. And and they will say, well, I don't believe in that stuff. Honey, we're all going to die, but when you die, it's all finished. It's over. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's extremely important for people like that if a friend can give them this book and say, hey, read this, because I know you've got your preconceived ideas, but maybe this book mm -hmm. could be of help to you, because the author and a lot of people in the world, a lot of people, probably the immense majority, of people in the world do believe in life after death, this can explain mm -hmm. that there is life after death and tell you what it's about. Yeah, as you point out here, I think this is really, what will surprise readers of this book is that the evidence for life after death has become considerably stronger in their own lifetime. We have more and more stories and documented situations which you go through in the book, right? Yes. Yeah, and especially that chapter on near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware much of them, I've heard about them, but in researching that I read two different books of the, the authors who were psychiatrists or doctors of some sort, and one of them didn't believe in life after death all that much himself until he came across it and one of the episode of some person then began to collect the experiences. And there's thousands and thousands now of documented near-death experiences where someone has come generally to a cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. their soul leaves the body, and a number of things happen. And whether the person was an atheist, whether it was a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, person of no religion whatsoever, young and old, of whatever background, uh, educationally, whatever, there's common experiences that they've all had. And one of the authors of those books said that he personally believes that all of these experiences put together are really pointing to what does happen when we die. So I think that evidence, which has probably been accumulated in the last 50 years or so, uh, is very helpful in, in saying, have a look at this. This is reality out there. Mm -hmm. This is people of all religions, people of no religion, finding that there's there's a heaven, there's a God, there's a judgment. Well, it's interesting because you, you mentioned the fact is that, you know, all of these people, whether they have religion or not religion or di all different religions having similar experiences. So someone would say, well, then why does it matter whether I'm Catholic or not? <laughs> That's always a question, Doug. In the Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium 16, we keep going back to that, says anyone can be saved if they follow the dictates of their conscience with an upright heart, helped by grace, they're in this situation through no fault of their own. And it led a lot of people, including Catholics, to say, why mission? And John Paul II addressed that in his encyclical on, on the missions, Radium Tardis Missio, the, the mission of the Redeemer. And, and so we, and the answer to the question, going back to the way you phrased it, and it's the way we ought to phrase it, is mm. yes, everybody can be saved. And there's some beautiful stories in the books mm -hmm. of, of people who have been saved and didn't have any religion at some stage. But it's a lot easier if you know God, if you have a religion, and especially the Catholic religion, which is the largest single religion in the world at the present time. And if you are a Catholic mm -hmm. and you have access to sacraments and to teachings of right and wrong, and you come to pray and to love this God who loves you, it is so much easier. You said, when I told a friend about the book I was writing, he immediately became enthused. He said that most of his friends with whom he went to school, a Christian school at that, no longer have any religion or belief in God, and some of them are dying from terminal illnesses, quite unprepared for what awaits them. Uh, he told me the story of his father, which you go through here about in the 1950s, etc. Like you said, other stories. Yeah. So there's so many people today, they've, they've lost their faith. Um, why do you think 
that's been the case. What has happened over the last, let's say, 50, 70 years that so many people just kind of wandered away? No, that's a very good question. That would require the, <laughs> the, um, the scientists, I suppose, the religion to, to answer. However, there's so many external influences at the present time in just the paganism of the way people live, the increasing atheism, and it's very prominent, and so people just drift away, often not with bad will, just a bit of laziness. I used to go to church, but I don't go anymore. I'm too busy. And so there's a just general drifting away because it really is the easier way on a Sunday sleep in. You don't have to go to, to church, whatever that church might be. Right. And, but then all the positive influences in the sense of negative but, but active influences on our lives that we're getting bombarded with in, in atheism and paganism, in um, a whole series of ideologies and ways of life mm. have helped people to go away. And I think it's been a time in the history of religion mm -hmm. when we've seen a mass exodus from religion, from churches. And, and so personally, personally, I believe this is going to come to an end. Right. God is going to wake us up, and this will happen in the next, not in my lifetime, probably in yours either, but in the next 50, 100 years where people will wake up and say, this isn't working, there's something wrong. Our kids right. are on drugs, they're sleeping with their girlfriends and boyfriends, they're not having kids anymore, um, what, what's going on? And they will come back to the basic truths of human nature and, and religion, and I really think we're going to see a, a coming back, mm -hmm. a, a positive renewal of faith in God. I really think we are. Right. A lot of times, that's, uh, that's, ch that's change is driven by uh, hitting bottom, I guess, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, in people's experiences. I thought this was interesting. Exactly. You said that when you get to my age, I was born in the 40s, you spent a lot of time attending funerals. Uh, you know, it's part of life and death, but it, 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 it turning out and you losing your friends and and the thing you say, which is the point, uh, you know, when is it going to be my turn? When is it going to be the people who are coming to my particular funeral? And you talk about the fact that it's important to, to also deal with the fact that it's not just older people. We're dealing, obviously, with high suicide rates of young people and high rates of depression, uh, you know, with young people. Uh, and many, you can point to, is because of a, a lack of faith, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and the other point, of course, is that it's not only old people who die when you mention that, but younger people. Tomorrow I'm, I'm preaching at a funeral of a man who died at 49 mm -hmm. of um, really a brain tumor which brought about a stroke. Four children about the same age as I was and my siblings when my dad died at 56. And it can come suddenly. And um, we have to be prepared all the time. Right. I'll just give you a little fact of this, this man that died. He had resisted the baptism of all of his children. He had no religion himself. His wife was a good Catholic from Indonesia. He had no religion. But just in the last months of his life, he took an interest in religion again, mm. had his children baptized. Uh, he was asking me many questions on the faith, suddenly had this episode with the stroke, went into hospital, the parish priest baptized him there, and within five days he had died. And because God found him towards the end of his short life of mm -hmm. 49 years, he was baptized, and now, as far as we know, probably is in heaven already because baptism takes away not only the guilt of sin but the temporal punishment. Right. It's never too late, and you never know what's uh, what's ahead. I thought it was interesting, too, you talk about placing a bet, you know, Pascal's wager, and it was always used to be the idea, well, you know, you're not yeah. sure which way it goes, so why not act like it is, and that way, if it is, you're covered, and if it's not, it doesn't really matter. It seems like today, in some ways, I think we have the reverse bet, is people bet that there either isn't anything, or if there is something, everybody goes there, so why should I bother? <laughs> and that's so true, too, that God is merciful and we're all going to go to heaven because God loves us. And, and that's a very dangerous attitude to have. I mean, God does love us, but he wants us to live well and be sorry for our sins. And 
So let's be prepared and let's let's bet. Let's go with Pascal. And the story in the in the book in Dying to Live, mm -hmm. on Pascal in the, in the chapter on Pascal's wager, I think exemplifies what many people today ought to be thinking. And this young man from New Zealand, 24 mm -hmm. years of age, and an absolute pagan. He he had committed every sin. He says that in other contexts that I that I that I accessed. And so he has been stuck, stung by a box jellyfish off the coast of Mauritius. He knows these creatures, which we have off the coast of Australia as well, will kill you in 10 to 15 minutes, mm -hmm. paralyze the nervous system. So he gets out of the boat. He's been stung five times. His arm is swollen to five to twice its, its normal size. The toxins are moving up his legs. And he says, I'm dying. And then he articulates Pascal's wager to a T. Mm -hmm. And this was, and he says, as an atheist, I don't believe in life after death. It's finished. It's all over. Cessation. But as a gambler, I'm gambling with my life here. Mm -hmm. What if I'm wrong? So it, that led to right. getting taken away in the ambulance, um, seeing the words of the Our Father, and so on. And so he ended up becoming a very good Christian when he recovered from his near-death experience. But we should all think, well, what if I'm wrong? This is important. Right. Well, you also you talk about the near-death experiences and, and you talk about the uh, idea that this particular Dr. Long, who found that only around 1% of the NDAs were, NDEs were negatively uh, having to deal with hellish and frightening, which makes people say, well, gee, see, everybody's basically going to heaven except for Mussolini and Hitler, maybe, uh, and a couple other people. But you also say Dr. Long has found that those who experience the hellish state, I thought this was really interesting, uh, say they actually chose it themselves. That is, they were not forced to be there, but rather it was their own free choices that had led them there. He says that's because these persons were such dark, evil beings. Their heaven was to be surrounded by others who were like them in doing evil. So again, that idea of God doesn't send anybody to hell, but we freely choose it whether we realize it or not. Yes, no, when I read that, I was immediately thinking of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1033, that I quote ad nauseum, and I know it by heart. But we don't go to hell by, um, by being sent by God. We go there by our own free choice. Those are the words of the Catechism. And that's what he found, that these people realize this is where they belong. It's, it's, it's quite a phenomenon, and we have to take that into account, too, that we can go to hell, and it will be because that's the way we lived, that's the way we died, we rejected God, we reject goodness, and people who go to hell have done good things, too, but mm -hmm. in the end, they were sorry for their sins, and right. so they realized, I deserve to be here. Right, so let's move on to the second book, The Final Exam, Preparing for the Judgment. Now, a lot of people would say, hopefully your Lord will give us a written, or is it is it basically curved so that, you know, you take the test, but everybody passes? <laughs> well, we, know, we don't know. One of the things that the church has never defined is how many people are there in hell, if there's anyone. And we do know that in the 20th century, there were a number of theologians, prominent people, who say it is reasonable to hope that there's no one in hell. Let's not enter into that question because that's, that's another matter. Mm -hmm. But there is a hell, and our Lord preached on it abundantly. And the church includes it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And so let us live our lives in such a way that when we do face God, and that can come at any time, we can be sorry for our sins at least. I mean, we can commit every sin in the book. As long as we're sorry for them, we won't go to hell. And we can be converted on our deathbed. There's at least one story in mm -hmm. one of those two books about a man that had rejected his son's priestly vocation. And then in the very last moment of his life, his son went to see him, right. trying to be reconciled with his dad. And the dad got up a little bit of energy, spat in his son's face, mm -hmm. and said, that's what I think of you and your church. Laid down and died. And then through some circumstances that are related in the book, Right. It turns out that he repented. He saw God, Christ on the cross, and repented in his own purgatory. Right. <laughs> in the section preparing for the final exam, 
You say many people have made multiple such changes in their lives. You talk about a particular person here. When all is said and done, failing an exam is not the end of the world. But there is one exam that is, and it is the end of the world, and that's the final exam. And your point is that that particular exam, the final judgment, is for real and for everyone, no matter whether you believe in it or not. Yes, and why can I say that? Well, because it is for real, because that's our faith. However, the near-death experiences often involve people going through that tunnel to the light and then seeing their whole life played out before them in an instant. And these were not necessarily people of belief in God, people of all religions, and not that they all had the experience of the judgment, but many of them did. And, and they call it the life review. And so having that experience mm. in, in people with no religion convinces us we better be prepared there is a judgment. Right. You also make the, the point that when this happens uh, and you're dealing with this, there's nobody else to go to, basically. You're, you're dealing with the Lord, and He knows everything. And a good way to understand it, to say, is that with everything we do or we don't do, we're writing another page in the book of our life. And I think I read in here the idea also that some people experience the idea of reviewing all their actions, but not only their actions, but actually feeling the feelings of the people you were acting on at the time. Yes, no, I found that extraordinary. I never mm -hmm. heard this. But there are a number of cases in these near-death experiences where the person not only saw their life played out as God sees it, not as we see it ourselves, and they said, I was allowed to feel what that other person felt when I said or did that thing. Now, mm -hmm. that's, in a sense, frightening because we might insult somebody right. and think nothing of it. But in the judgment, we might be able to feel what the other person felt when we insulted them. And that's, that's uh, something to be <laughs> somewhat uh, wary of if it happens. So let's try to be good on earth. One of the other things about near-death experiences, too, is that invariably, when the person comes back to life, they, they are much happier, they're not afraid of death, and they, they live a much better life after that. So we don't have to have a near-death experience in order to change our lives for the better. Let's just read about it. And you can read about it in numerous books, Counts of Life, uh, Near-Death Experiences. You can read it in my book as well. And uh, there we, let's try to live a better life. Then we're better off here on Earth, as you mentioned, with Pascal's wager. And that was one of Pascal's ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and then we'll be really well prepared for what does come when we die. Right. You, you talk about some of the things you'll be judged on, and of course you, you basically have, you know, effectively the, the Ten Commandments in here. One of them you, you hit on, a person who commits adultery fails in his or her commitment to their spouse to remain faithful. The spouses have a right to the fidelity of their partner, and adultery violates that right. So it is an offense against justice, and is obviously an offense against charity since it shows a great lack of love for one's spouse. Now, I don't think most people know what that word means, adultery means anymore, because you never hear it used. Every other euphemism is used. Uh, and you also include polygamy, which years ago people used to laugh when it came up about the fact that we're going to be dealing with that soon, and we are dealing with that now. Yes, and uh, one of the things that, in, in the challenge in writing that second book, The Final Exam, was to put everything in terms of the natural law and as I was beginning to write the book, the thought occurred to me, am I going to write about contraception, about abortion, about euthanasia, about adultery? And, and I said, well, I really have to, don't I? Because I'll be letting the reader down if I don't. And in then putting everything, not in terms of the Bible and the catechism or the saints, mm -hmm. but in terms of the natural law one finds it's not that difficult to do. So right. all of the areas covered in the final exam are based on a reason, the natural law. And so whether we be, have the name adultery or not, or some other name mm -hmm. for our various ill practices, uh, some things are just right. plain wrong, <laughs> and God will accuse us of them when we die.
Right. And you mentioned that with the final exam, we must be sorry for our sins. But you also point this out because some people say, well, look, my life's been more difficult than this person. That's not really fair. How am I going to how are they going to be judged? You say Christ himself gives us the well-known parable of the talents where one person was given five talents, another two and another one. It is an image of God giving different opportunities and abilities to each person and judging them according how they used what they were given. Yeah, that is so very important. In, in the final chapter of the final exam, which I titled The Final Exam, there's some considerations of the judgment itself. And one of them, I think this is one of the most important ones. We are going to be judged differently, all of us. I am a priest but I'm going to be judged differently from many other priests. I'm a priest of Opus Dei. Mm. I've been given a lot of really solid formation. I've been helped by living in a center with other people that, that support me in my priestly work, in my human life. God can expect more from me. I live with a saint, Saint Josemaria, for two years in Rome. Mm -hmm. I had hundreds of get-togethers with him. That is a very powerful influence in my priesthood, in my life. God is going to ask much more of me mm -hmm. than he can ask of many other priests. So, and we can all right. be uh, confident that God will judge us in his mercy and justice in accordance with what he's given us. And if someone has one talent, that's all God expects. Right, absolutely. Another, so, actually, uh, well, another uh, point in that final chapter. Sure, go ahead. I was going to say that some people asked me, even after the book had come out or when I was writing it, but how, what happens when somebody grew up in a culture of cannibalism? And that was all they knew. They just killed their enemies, and then they ate them. And I said, well, God will take that into account, too. That was all they knew. They are in that situation through no fault of their own, right. as William Gentium 16 puts it. So we don't have to worry. God will judge right. us differently in accordance with what we knew, with the gifts that he has given right. us and the possibilities. But we can't avoid the truth on purpose and think that's going to help us out. Thank you so much, Father John Flatter. Two books, Dying to Live, <laughs> Reflections on Life After Death, and also the final exam, Preparing for the Judgment, uh, from Perugia Media. And look for a new book coming as well from Father. Uh, this has been an EWTN bookmark coming from Sydney, Australia. Thanks for joining us.